Again, we're really grateful to have you with us. And I hope you're as excited as I am about these two great presenters and hearing about their new books, which both deal with diaspora and taking really important critical looks at different cultures. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our Dean Martin Room to talk a little bit about the importance and the value of doing this additional publication work on top of our normal load. And then we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Each one will have about 20 or 30 minutes. We'll have some time for questions after each. And then we're hoping that we can synthesize some of the ideas at the end for kind of a deeper discussion. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Martin. All right, so I'm gonna do my little pollen, pollen Hayes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, shout out to, to uh, our scholars for, uh, for getting books uh, out in, a, in an environment where, you know, obviously we've, we've had a lot of challenges in, in the last year because of COVID, but in general, as our research, uh, we are a, a public regional comprehensive university where research is, is just not the same sort of part of the workload that it is at a, at a research one institution. And yet we do really cool stuff, really groundbreaking stuff and, and often stuff that has uh, research that has uh, kind of that edge of, of, of sort of extra relevance and, and engagement with, with the wider community. And I think both of these works reflect that commitment. Uh, and that that engagement, and so uh, I want to commend both both of our authors today for uh, for their accomplishments, uh, accomplished under duress, we might say, or a little extra pressure, and yet um, research that that is uh, that that is right up there in terms of quality with what we would get out of our um, our fellow institutions that have that that extra research component as kind of a part of their mission. Um, so I, I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. Uh, again, congratulating our, our two authors who are presenting today um, and uh, commend them for this terrific work. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. So I have put the information for Aston's book in the chat and I will go ahead and do his introduction so we can hear more from him. So our colleague, Dr. Aston Gonzalez, is an associate professor of history here at Salisbury University, who specializes in African-American culture and politics during, and I love this phrase, the long 19th century. He earned his PhD in history at the University of Michigan. He has published widely on African-American portraiture during the early Republic, black citizenship during the Civil War, the creation of African-American archives, the visual representation of escaped slaves and free black ab abolitionists. His most recent publication is his book that we'll hear about today, Visualizing Equality, African-American Rights and Visual Culture in the 19th Century that the University of North Carolina Press released in September. The book examines how the fight for racial equality in the 19th century played out not only in marches and political conventions, but also in print and visual culture created and disseminated throughout the United States by African-Americans. African-American activists seized these opportunities and produced images that advanced campaigns for black rights. Reviewers called the book trailblazing inspirational and masterful. Thank you so much for presenting it to us today, Aston. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to present at this colloquium. Um, this is really an opportunity, I think, to share with my wonderful colleagues um, the, the work that I do, but also I think some of the really pressing concerns uh, of the 19th century. And I think this is a, also a topic that is relevant to us today because we've seen so much of the activism uh, related to racial violence here in the United States, especially um, after the death of George Floyd here last summer. So uh, if we think about what activism looks like, I think it's more than, and that we, we all know that it's more than the, the people marching in the streets and the, the legal cases that come before courts. But I think also if we look to the 19th century, we see that there's a really important visual component to this kind of activism, to try to make our country, to make our world a more equitable, fair and just place. 
So black activists really knew what this was all about. And the 19th century is also a period when there are not only these different social movements taking place to try to reform society, but also it's combined with this technological revolution that changes the way that people see one another and see um, themselves. So I'll share my screen here to, to give you a sense of some of the material that I'm working with in this book because it's amazingly rich and uh, I think very relevant, not only to the 19th century and the, the lives that people led, but also to our 21st century lives, lives as well. So this is the cover of my book, Visualizing Equality, African-American Rights and Visual Culture in the 19th Century. And these two images are actually taken um, from the interior of the book. They're both images that I analyze dur during the chapters on the 1830s and also the 1850s. And the significance of them, I think, gets a little bit more, um, a, li a little clearer as I go on in this presentation. And I wanted to start actually, uh, you know, Chris, Chris mentioned that, um, you know, I, I researched the long 19th century, which, you know, basically extends, you know, the 19th century a little bit into the 18th and perhaps a little bit into the 20th as well. But primarily as somebody who's trained in the 19th century, I tend to look er a little bit earlier to see what are some of the origins of the ideas circulating in the 19th. So 19th century. So I wanted to start here at the end of the 18th century to give you all a sense of what kinds of ideas were circulating across the Atlantic, because there's a pretty vibrant anti-slavery culture that emerges in England in the, um, in the 18th century. And a lot of the ideas that American anti-slavery activists adopt come from the English. Now they're tweaked, they're, adopt, they're adapted, they are um, sort of used in a particular um, way for the United States and for people here. But this is one of the, the diagrams that's actually circulated here um, across the Atlantic that demonstrates the barbarity, the inhumanity of the transatlantic slave trade, right? This is a diagram of a ship uh, that, that demonstrates how enslaved people who are stolen from the continent of Africa are transported across the ocean, um, right there. It's, it's a profit making business, right? It, this is the way to, to increase the, the economic production, we'll say, of slave traders, or at least that's how they see it. Because the, the majority of these, these sl sl slave ships, right, carry between 200 and 400 enslaved people at the outset of their voyage. Some carry as more than 600, but these individuals are, right, men, women, and children are crammed into the, the depths, the bowels of these ships. Um, and sometimes the, the voyage takes two months to get across the Atlantic, right, to Brazil or to the Caribbean as just their first or their second stops before they come to the United States or the colonies, right? But then uh, later the colonies become the United States. So here we have this kind of, this diagram that's supposed to make people believe um, in the inhumanity of slavery, just giving a, a simple visual description of what it's like, um, you know, removed from all of the, the pain, the disease, the suffering, the violence, the rebellions that take place on these slave ships. But when we think about the anti-slavery movement, we often think about these iconic images. And that's, iconic is a word that's used quite a lot now in the 21st century. But I wanna take us back to the, uh, an older usage of the word iconic, uh, right? These images that bear with them an incredible amount of weight that convey a particular sense of religiosity here in this image of a kneeling slave who is written about as having taken a knee in order to pray for their deliverance from slave traders or slave catchers. And this image, right, this iconic image really begins in the 1780s in England again. And it's printed not just on um, jewelry, but it's also printed on any number of things like stationery, like uh, brooches, purses. There are uh, medallions and coins that bear this image as well. And we have on the right, a, a free black man who's created an image 
right? The image that you see here, it's engraved by Patrick Henry Reason, who was born free in New York in um, the 18 teens. And he's one of these African-Americans who really takes up visual tools, right? So the, the engraver's tools or a lithographer's tools and later the photographer's tools like the camera in order to depict um, African-Americans as deserving of rights, right? The right to freedom, the right to voting rights um, in New York state, for example, the right to edu public education, the right to hold office, right? These are images that are used and circulated in books, in pamphlets, in standalone paper that people write their letters on and send to one another all across the United States. So again, when we're thinking about this image, the kneeling slave, for example, it shows up all over the anti-slavery press. So African-Americans like Patrick Henry Reason really sort of benefit from, and the anti-slavery movement benefits from this steam printing press that really becomes a powerful um, activist tool here in the 19th century because it can create images and, and text. It can print impressions very, very quickly and circulate hundreds of thousands of newspapers or pamphlets that um, can be used to try to convince people that slavery needs to end, for example. And Black folks are really confronting these really negative images of themselves in newspapers and pamphlets and in images all across the country. So this is one that is published in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it's one of many quote unquote Bobolition prints, which is a, it's a, it's a word that makes fun of the way that African-Americans allegedly say the word abolition because Black folks are celebrating the end of the international slave trade, which goes into effect January 1st, 1808. And they celebrate this day, right? For years, for decades after, and they're mocked because of that celebration, right? So here we have a, a, a broadside effectively, that is a, a fabricated conversation between four black people that basically just makes fun of the way that they pronounce words and ideas related to democracy and freedom. It's not just in Boston, it's in Philadelphia, it's in New York, it's throughout the South. These images and newspapers and printed materials generally really identify African-Americans as be not being worthy of any station other than one that is less than people of European descent. So we have a very um, popular, series of images created by a Philadelphian, Edward Williams Clay. This is the Life in Philadelphia series, which basically mocks African-Americans who have, who are often very well-educated, who have some money or even a lot of money, right? But basically he mocks them as being unable to acquire the same kind of class or status or sort of real intellectual capability that people of European descent have. This is also the era in the 1820s and 30s when blackface minstrelsy really explodes in the US. So African-Americans are combating that as well, right? African-Americans are, you know, allegedly, you know, uh, happy as enslaved people in the South. And that's what Jim Crow, the figure Jim Crow celebrates. He's dancing, he's singing, he's constantly making jokes about himself and uh, by extension, people of African descent. So African Americans who are encountering these types of ideas in American culture more broadly recognize the power of images. They recognize the power of printed materials to change the way or influence the way that people think about race and the United States more broadly. So for example, we have uh, just a handful of images during this era of and about African Americans so we have uh, the first black bishop of the AME church, right? He's one of the founders of the AME church. Um, this is Richard Allen, who helps to circulate positive ideas of black ministers such as himself. We also get an image here on the right that depicts a black church in Philadelphia. This is St. Thomas Episcopal, right? It's the, the African Episcopal church that celebrates 
right? The ways that African Americans have created institutions, they've accumulated wealth, they've um, they've been able to educate themselves, and they've been able to tap into resources that um, white allies have helped to create for them, for example. So they're creating images. Um, they're they're both the image makers and also the subject of images that white allies create. So. I mentioned Patrick Henry Reason before, he's a black man in, in New York. There's also a, an African-American man, Robert Douglas Jr., who's practicing in Philadelphia. And he creates images of white allies like, um, like William Lloyd Garrison here in the print, but also Robert Douglas Jr. creates images of black folks, African-American uh, uh, musicians, African-Americans who wish to be uh, delivered from slavery, right, as a way of trying to convince audiences that Black folks are worthy of freedom, that they're worthy of the kinds of rights that people, that, that people of European descent, especially men, are privy to and increasingly gain during the 1820s and 30s and 40s, the age known as, you know, the, the age of, of Jackson. This, this period of Jacksonian democracy, when more and more people can vote, right? That is more people of, uh, more men of European descent, whereas those rights are being uh, restricted from, from women and also uh, African-Americans. So these two men here are actually depicted, right? This is James Williams and Peter Wheeler. These are images that accompany their escape slave narratives. Patrick Henry Reason creates these images of men who very recently have been enslaved, right? They look very different from the images of Jim Crow, who's this fabricated figure who is allegedly enslaved and very happy, right? With his patched clothing, his sort of disheveled um, his pants, his, his hat turned sort of awry. Um, these are very different men. They're projecting a, a kind of genteel, very composed, and middle-class or elite kind of sensibility that again greets viewers of these men's escape slave narratives. So people are given a choice, right? Do they think about African-Americans who are formerly enslaved as unworthy of rights, who are not respectable, who don't really deserve a place in the American polity like a lot of other people? Well, no, if you're going by their image, right? And that's the thing. Men like Patrick Henry Reason and Robert Douglas Jr. know that people are seeing images much more commonly here in the 1830s and 40s when the kind of technology brings images into American households far more frequently, that people are actually consuming images and the ideas contained within them that are related to race, that are related to class. Um, Right? The same thing is going on here in these images in terms of conveying a particular idea about race and, um, and class and suitability to the American public as those very derogatory images that we saw earlier. They're obviously opposite messages, um, but it's the same kind of strategy that's occurring here in these images. This too is a, an escaped slave narrative frontispiece that accompanies Henry Bibb's story, right? He's, uh, he escaped slavery many times from Kentucky to other states in the, in the South and the Upper South, the Deep South and the Upper South. But what's fascinating here to me, and I, I bring this out with students, we, we discuss this at length, is the fact that there are two images of Bibb, one of him escaping in this city scene, this urban scene down below him, which sort of reminds people that slavery existed in urban spaces, including New York and Boston, Philadelphia, but also places like Louisville. Um, what we have too is his signature, right? The fact that he's testifying to his ability to read and write, most specifically to write, but we assume also that he can read given the fact that he's holding a book, right? That extra addition of the object in this image, in this portrait, right? It, it only sort of, sort of uh, supports the idea that Henry Bibb is worthy, 
right? He is an educated man. He's a very gifted public speaker. He actually comes on the scene before uh, Frederick Douglass does. He's actually more popular and more famous as a speaker than Frederick Douglass before he passes away uh, at a very young age, just a few years actually after this, um, his book is published. And then obviously uh, Frederick Douglass becomes very popular and, and lives a very long and uh, ex established life. But Henry Bibb here is, is celebrated as a, a very deserving individual who is metaphorically and, and literally miles away from slavery and all of the ideas, the negative ideas that are associated with it, right? It's, it's the way that he's posed, it's what he's wearing, it's his hair, the way it's coiffed, um, it's, his, it's his book, right? His possession of that book and the way he's holding it too that signals a kind of mastery of education. Patrick Henry Reason is also celebrating black leaders, just like the Reverend Allen that you saw earlier in the slideshow. Instead, here we have Reverend Peter Williams, who is a, a black minister in New York City, who is uh, personally known to, to um, Patrick Henry Reason. And this is actually sold for years after after um, Williams's death. Why? Because it's a way that people can commemorate, people can remember and celebrate the lives and active, the, the, sorry, not the lives, the, um, the, the activism certainly of people like Williams. Williams is a proponent. He's at the forefront of trying to get African-American children the right to public education in New York City. He helps to establish a number of schools. He is a very well-respected community member. He even takes kind of controversial you know, stances on emigration, that is voluntary movement of African-Americans from the United States to places outside the country. And he sort of backtracks on that later in life, but he's really trying to imagine these different ways for people of African descent to gain a better life whether that means through education, whether it means physically removing themselves to a safer or a better or a more economically viable place, right? So be it. Williams is, is one of these individuals who, again, people can purchase this image. It's fairly large actually, and they can hang it in their, their, their home, right? We talked a little, or I mentioned a little bit how these images were printed in books. They're also printed as very large broadsides, as very large portraits that people can collect and do collect and keep in their homes, right? Imagine framing this. This is what people would do with images of this size. They would frame it and they would put it on their wall. So there'd be a constant reminder of Williams, right? This established black leader of which there are just a handful, not just in New York City, but elsewhere in the country but also people would, would be remembered of, uh, well, would be rem reminded rather of the, the kinds of work that Williams dedicated his life to. Uh, if, we, if we turn our gaze to Philadelphia again, we know that Robert Douglas Jr. again celebrated white allies who helped to end slavery. Abby Kelly Foster is one of them. She is an incredibly well-traveled, uh, that is throughout the United States, activist who speaks about the barbarities of slavery, but also she's a women's rights activist who is uh, unfortunately today very, uh, very unknown by most people, but yet she's perhaps the best traveled or the most traveled woman of her generation, or perhaps even in American history. She is tireless in traveling throughout the United States to give these speeches. And she actually has this image created of her from a daguerreotype, from a photograph that Robert Douglas Jr. creates. But he specifically chooses to create a large photo, a large portrait of her. He lithographs this so that it can be reproduced. That's the thing with daguerreotypes, these, the first real photograph. You can only make one at a time. They're unique. They're very delicate. They're made of glass and metal and they can crack, they can break very easily. This is on a piece of paper, this portrait of Foster. And so she's actually able to circulate this. Douglas is able to sell this in his shop window and at his store more broadly there in Philadelphia. 
not just one or two, or two but 20 or 50. We don't actually know the number, but we know that it's advertised in several places and that far more of these were made than just one daguerreotype, right? So the technology here is powerful, right? The type of image it is really helps to determine its circulation. So this here on the left is another uh, lithograph that is created after a daguerreotype of, of Robert Douglas Jr.'s, and it celebrates the accomplishments of the black band leader and musician, Frank Johnson who, as you can see, is holding a bugle. He's very well known, not just in the United States, but he even goes to England. He plays for the queen, um, right? He's well known because of his musical prowess and also for his composition skills. He's the first black musician who composes music in the United States that historians know of. And we see here on the table, not only a quill and an inkwell, but also the music that he's composed. There's a whole uh, treasure trove of these compositions in his hand, his original pieces that are still held in the Library Company of Philadelphia, right? It's an archive, the archives um, in their storage area. So this is a way too of commemorating Frank Johnson because the image is created a couple of years after he dies. This is a way of raising funds for his widow but it's also a way for people to remember the power of a black leader, somebody who's well respected and somebody who gains a kind of financial success as well that is so rare among African-Americans during this time. We also know that the, the, on the flip side, of course, that there are individuals who are punished for trying to help African-Americans, for being anti-slavery activists, for example, we see in this daguerreotype, right, of which there's only one, um, the one original daguerreotype, somebody who's been branded, right? This is a, a white sea captain. Uh, this is Jonathan Walker, whose palm was actually branded because of his anti-slavery work. This daguerreotype is saved, right? It's, it's been uh, passed down, it's been um, protected. And it's currently here uh, in the US in the Massachusetts Historical Society. And we're thinking, when we're thinking about the way images and, and texts circulated, African Americans are part of this story more broadly as well, because Black women in particular are creating what are called friendship albums during this period of the 1830s, where they circulate essentially diaries that they don't create entries in but instead they give to their friends, their loved ones, family friends, and they ask them to leave messages, to paint watercolors that you know, are basically ways of communicating uh, political ideas as well as you know, uh, tips for what adulthood should be like or how to, to sort of manage or navigate adult life, right? And these are kept for decades sometimes. The image you see on the screen here is one that's maintained by uh, Amy Matilda Cassie, who keeps this for more than two decades during the 1830s through the 1850s, right? And in one of these, one of these friendship albums, Robert Douglas Jr. leaves a watercolor that conveys the importance of being an anti-slavery activist, right? That conveys the importance of trying to end slavery. Again, it's this kneeling slave image, which is very, right, has many decades of history at this point. And it conveys to not just Amy Matilda Cassie, but everybody else who opens up that friendship album, right? And it circulates to Philadelphia, through Philadelphia, to Boston, to New York, right? Everybody who sees this not only knows that Robert Douglas Jr. is an anti-slavery activist, but also that they should be as well. I'm simplifying things a bit here, but I think it really kind of conveys the importance of circulation of these types of ideas of African-American images by African-American artists. So this isn't again, uh, just limited to printed materials. What we get in the 1850s is the revival of the moving panorama. It's effectively the precursor of the movie. So it's essentially a, um, uh, a scroll that is pulled taut between two moving cylinders so that a scene 
moves in front of a large audience of people, men, women, and children, who typically pay a few cents to, um, to see the, uh, the, the moving panorama. And in the 1850s, there are three black men who have very successful moving panoramas, two of whom are formerly enslaved. The two men here, um, Henry Box Brown, Henry Wells Brown are formerly enslaved and James Presley Ball Sr. who is a free black man who is living primarily in Ohio. The three of them create moving panoramas, the, the figure of which is, is here to give you a, a visual of what it looks like. And that helps to um, change the way that people are A, knowledgeable about slavery because they're seeing these images of enslaved people on these large canvases, right? These are about 10 feet tall, eight to 10 feet tall. You can't be entirely sure because advertisements sometimes uh, exaggerate or use hyperbole when describing the size of these moving panoramas, none of which are extant, none of which survive, sadly. But these moving panoramas quite literally change the way that people think about race and slavery. Because before these three men create their moving panoramas, slavery had been depicted in them in previous uh, moving panoramas, but they were romanticized. They were actually celebrated, right? The idea of uh, slavery and sort of the, the economic opportunities that it provided to, to Southerners in particular were celebrated by these, um, by these very, very well-attended moving panoramas. But Williams, well, William Wells Brown actually decided to create his own moving panorama because he saw the romanticized versions of slavery. And as a formerly enslaved man, he wouldn't stand for that kind of misinformation, that fake news being circulated to audiences. And we're talking hundreds of thousands of people who attended these moving panoramas. So here we have an advertisement of one of them, for example, which I think really um, demonstrates the ways that they are pitched, right? The ways that they are marketed. It's not just about slavery all the time. It really depends on the city. Sometimes they're advertised as uh, a scenery of the American landscape. Sometimes like in, in places or cities like Boston and Cincinnati, they're more marketed as anti-slavery uh, moving panoramas because they're trying to gauge their market, right? These individuals are trying to draw people to their panoramas and then they try to convince them, right? They show them scenes of people. I mean, sometimes they're really horrific, the descriptions that accompany these that we read about in these accompanying pamphlets. Sometimes people are depicted uh, burning alive. They're like, uh, you know, bloodhounds that chase after enslaved people. There are slave auction scenes, right? This is really, really violent and disturbing material that these purveyors are making accessible to the public. But it's essential, right? In the eyes of these three moving panorama um, you know, purveyors, they're really trying to convince viewers that slavery needs to end, right? And the money that they gain, right? The profits, the revenues, from these moving panoramas are often donated right back to the anti-slavery societies that many of these um, individuals work with. So here, for example, is a page from William Wells Brown's pamphlet that notifies people where they can give their money to, right? Additional donations, not just the, the payments that they made at the door in order to see the moving panorama, but you'll notice that this is in the British, right? This is in the UK. These men toured their moving panoramas. Right? We see that uh, Henry Box Brown and William Wells Brown, the two formerly enslaved men, they actually take their moving panoramas to Scotland, to England, to Wales, and they raise money. They fundraise across the Atlantic Ocean in order to try to end slavery here in the US. Some people, like Augustus Washington, who is a free black man who actually goes to Dartmouth for a few years, um, but becomes a, and then later becomes a teacher and a photographer in Hartford, Connecticut. Some people, some African-Americans like him, believe that there was no future for African-Americans 
in the United States if, in terms of uh, living a life of equality with people of European descent. So for example, he takes these images of successful black politicians in Liberia where he emigrates, right? He basically sells his, uh, most of his materials in Hartford. He packs up his stuff, he moves his family across the Atlantic and he becomes very successful there, right? And he sends back images that can be used to help uh, to convince other people of African descent to move to Liberia. He depicts views, landscape views sometimes of the city, of the capital of Monrovia, Liberia, as a way of demonstrating how civilized it is, right? In contrast to the kinds of rumors that are circulating in American culture that depict Africa and particularly Liberia as a, a land of heathens, as a land of backwardness and as a land of uh, barbarism. And this is right as the Civil War is about to break out. And we get these images of African-Americans, especially those who are formerly enslaved, who are the subjects of violence. Right? These are images that are circulated in newspapers, illustrated newspapers, which hundreds of thousands of people buy each week. And so this is perhaps one of the most famous images that I'm sure many of you are familiar with of this man named Gordon, who, or who is named Gordon in this, in this, uh, in this write-up. But that's typically how people are, uh, who are reading these illustrated newspapers encounter African-Americans until they start to enlist in the, the Union military after they're allowed to, according to the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that, was, that goes into effect January 1, 1863. We have uh, James Presley Ball, as I mentioned earlier, one of these purveyors of the moving panorama, who is taking photographs, for example, of an escaped slave woman in his Cincinnati studio. This is him, this is a disturbing image, yes, but these two men are actually protecting this uh, fugitive from slavery. They're actually accompanying her away from Kentucky, where she had been sold to a house of prostitution and she escaped to Cincinnati with their help. And she's dressed in the clothing of a very famous anti-slavery activist, Levi Coffin, who helps to get her to freedom. The three men and her um, go to the train station and they put her on a train where she goes to freedom in Wisconsin. Ball is also responsible for, um, you know, creating images of Frederick Douglass, for example, and selling them down the Mississippi River to raise funds for what it means to have a powerful black man as a, as a, as a national spokesman of some ideas related to slavery and, and voting, right? And so this is the material that we get coming out of James Presley Ball's uh, photography studio. We see black soldiers, black seamen, black leaders here. And that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, some of the main images that I, that I write about here in my, in my book. And I'm, I'm very happy to discuss more of them with you and to also have a conversation about what they meant and as they, you know, as they circulated here in the middle decades of the 19th century. So thank you. Thank you. And then if you don't mind, Aston, to stop sharing your screen, we'll have a moment as we transition. If there's a question or comment you'd like to make, please do. And then I promise we'll have more at the end. Maybe just a quick one. Um, how did, uh, was it Edward James Roy end up on the cover? Yeah, it's a great question. So Edward James Roy um, ended up being a president uh, one of the Liberian presidents, a little bit after this, um, this photograph was taken by Augustus Washington. But uh, the, the press just asked me, do you, do you have any images that um, you think would be especially instructive or, or powerful? You know, something that would really catch people's attention. And we, we went a little bit, you know, had a little back and forth about what would be um, really engaging to viewers. And we, we decided on these two images, I think because they, they demonstrate, or they, they're very provocative, but they demonstrate the ways that there's a, a much earlier anti-slavery movement that's referenced by the, the kneeling slave, right? The, the boom slave. Um, they're sort of uh, 
on the lower left of the cover. And then also the fact that there's an alternative view, right? That it's not just about ending slavery here in the United States, but it's also about the possibility for black leadership positions else, elsewhere outside of the United States. And so that's why uh, Roy was chosen because he's this sort of uh, model of what, what could be um, elsewhere. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, we can go ahead and transition to our colleague EJ Hahn. And again, I promise we'll have more time for questions at the end. I also put her book information in the chat. EJ Hahn is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication here at SU. She received her PhD in communication from Washington State University. The main area of her research and teaching is intercultural communication, including global migration and diaspora, multiculturalism and diversity, stereotypes, prejudices, and discrimination against minorities, Asians and Asian Americans, and second language learning and teaching. Dr. Han received the 2020 Outstanding Book Award by the Asian Pacific American Communication Studies Division of the National Communication Association with the book that she edited with two co-editors, Korean Diaspora Across the World, Homeland in History, Memory, Imagination, Media, and Reality. This volume analyzes the Korean diaspora across the world and traces the meaning and the performance of homeland through different types of diaspora discourses, such as pers personal familial, negatives, oral life histories, public and media. The book also examines the notion of space, arguing meanings of space and place for Korean diaspora are increasingly multifaceted. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. Thank you, Chris. So we need to um, share screen. So first of all, I wanna say thank you for everyone um, for joining this event out of your busy schedule. I know for many of you guys, both the student and the student, April is the busiest month of the spring semester. Thank you. And I also want to say thank you to these two co-authors and co-editors of this book, Dr. Mina Huan and uh, Dr. Zhong Wan Li. For me, this is the very first experience of a publishing book, and I had zero confidence of doing this. So without their help, support, this wouldn't be happen. Um, today, I tried to invite them, but um, Tuesday, Thursday, they have a heavy teaching schedule, so they couldn't make it. But again, um, I believe credit should go to these two co-editors, not me. And at the end of my presentation, I will um, briefly talk about those 12 contributors. Um, so this book, consists of two parts. Part one is mainly about the narratives or the memory of an individual. It's about personal experience and their memory. So these six chapters from chapter two, chapter seven, others talked about Korean diaspora's experience or um, their memory based on the in-depth interview or the um, rarely or other types of qualitative research method. Second part is about public discourse surrounding the issues or the life of Korean diaspora across the world. So it talks about um, how mainstream media presented them or how those Korean diaspora perpetuate or maintain their national ethnic cultural identity through their own ethnic media. And also um, role of social media, how those younger generation of Korean diaspora use social media 
to promote or sometimes resist their Korean ethnic identity. And I'm sure many of you guys already know what are the typical content or information in chat one introduction. So usually introduction provide the summary of all chapters or brief overview or background of the topic. And I didn't like that kind of typical traditional introduction. So I decided to write my own family history as an introductory chapter of this book. So um, in my book, in my first chapter, I talked about the experience of three generations of my family, grandparents, parents, and my generation. And I showed how the experience of my family members or my family history is related to some major historical event of the history of the Korean diaspora. Um, by the way, this photo um, is my father's barber shop. My father was a barber, and as you can see, this is old, old, old barber shop, and nobody lives here. But we keep this old building, as well as my father's uniform, gown, scissors, and our um, the school uniform, note, textbook, everything, because we want to have a family museum in future. So um, let me start with the first generation, my grandparents' generation. Um, so this is my grandfather on my father's side, and this is my grandfather on mom's, my mom's side. My parents, me, older sister, younger brother. Trust me, she is my younger sister, although she looks like a boy. Um, so um, the global migration of Korean started, began mid of the 19th century. And the majority of those migrants are from southern part, rural area of South Korea. Many of them were peasant, poor farmers. And most of them moved to the Japan, of course, a nearby country, China, and Russia. So um, for them, it's almost like the only options to survive. At that time, even before um, Korea became colonizer, they lived in extremely poor living condition. And again, um, to survive, they had to get out of uh, Korea, their own homeland, their own country. And of course, uh, um, as they became colonized of Japan, it became worse and worse and worse. And those uh, Koreans uh, here in Japan, they, many of them also were sent to here, southern part of uh, Salim Island. So this is um, the territory of Russia, but during the World War II, um, it belonged to Japan. Japan took southern part of this island. And of course, at the end of World War II, they returned it to the Russia. So um, those uh, after World War II, Japanese government took only Japanese coal mining workers and their family members got back to Japan. And they didn't take a Korean workers saying that 
your country, Korea will come here soon. Just wait, maybe um, a couple of weeks, your country will take you guys back to your homeland, your country. Russia, same, yeah. You guys are Korean, we don't care. Um, maybe your country, Korea, will take care of you guys. Just wait. However, Korea, they didn't have a room to think of any other um, overseas Koreans. Even within the Korea, they had too many things. As you guys, some of you guys know, um, in 1950, there was a Korean war in North Korea, South Korea, and even those people in Korea struggled. No room to think about those ethnic Koreans overseas, foreign country. So those 43,000 Koreans here, they were completely abandoned by Korea, their own country, Japan, Russia, nobody took care of him. But they, with the hope of going back to their homeland, many of them didn't obtain Russian citizenship, but they kept teaching Korean language, kept um, having Korean culture, but almost 50 years, they couldn't come back to Korea. Um, so my grandfather, um, he went to Japan with the members of all of his family, but he came back to Korea immediately after he lost his first son, and also, um, I heard he was injured, but since he died when I was very young, three, four years old, I don't remember anything. I didn't hear anything from him. And uh, my grandfather here, um, two of his older brother went to Japan saying that you should stay here taking care of parents. And then we will be back once we make enough money. So you stay here. And um, one of those two brothers came back to Korea after the um, end of World War II. But the other brother moved to here. So um, as I already explained, uh, those people here, they couldn't return to Korea until 1990. So um, right after the Korean War, Korean government stopped diplomatic relations with Russia because the Soviet Union, Russia, communist country, South Korea, democratic country. There's no diplomatic relations at all. But um, 1990, um, Korea resumed this relation with the uh, um, Russia and my grandfather, he was a well-educated, intelligent person. So he sent a petition letter, every single government office uh, saying that I have an older brother in Russia, please let me visit there. And then um, at least I want to see if he's still alive or not. And my grandfather was not the only one but there were lots of people who um, had their family members in Russia. So Korean government changed their um, immigration policy or the um, national policy and decided to accept all of those uh, um, ethnic Koreans from Russia with a permanent residency. So my grandfather's older brother, um, visited multiple times in the early 1990. And finally, he decided to permanently move to Korea in 2000. Um, so as I already mentioned, those first generation migrating to China or Japan or Russia, it was kind of the only option to survive. But for most of them, that experience was kind of a shame. 
something they don't want to share, they don't want to teach it to their offspring. Mm, it's not good. It's just better to forget about it and work harder so that my offspring had a better life. So um, my grandfather is not, on, not the only one, but most of my family members uh, didn't teach it anything about what they experienced during the um, Japanese colonization or um, my grandfather's brother's life in Russia. It was like, a, don't ask, don't tell. So it was an unspoken, unheard story. So, um, for those uh, um, first generation diaspora, homeland is a kind of imaginary or symbolic place. So what um, my grandfather's brother, in his mind, the homeland is the place where he left when he was only 20. And the current Korean society is totally different country, totally different. But still, he kept that image and when he visited um, Korea early 1990, he brought lots of uh, cookies, candies, uh, and poor quality clothes. And at that time, I was a college student, and what? Nobody wear this kind of poor quality dress, no. As a um, person in advanced country, mm -mm, I was not uh, appreciated with all the poor quality items in my um, grandfather's brother brought from the Russia. But again, in his mind, Korea is still a poor country. And for them, homeland is the place they must return, no matter what happened or regardless of your condition. So um, as I mentioned, the Korean government decided to accept those ethnic Koreans from Russia, but they accepted only those people who were born or resided there before 1945. So those uh, um, Korean diaspora from the Russia, they couldn't take their children, grandchildren, no, only himself, herself, and their spouse. And most of them were the 70, 80. So they knew even if I permanently return to my homeland, Korea, I will have a less than 10 years life. But still, a lot of people came back, returned to Korea saying, I want to die in my homeland. Although I have to leave my children, grandchildren in Russia. And for many of them, um, Russian became their first language. They've been there for almost 50 years and they forgot Korean language. They are more comfortable with Russian to the Russian culture. But just because it's uh, their homeland, the place they were born, they decided to return. And uh, yeah, my grandfather's uh, older brother, he um, moved to 2000 and then passed away 2010. So he stayed, lived in Korea only 10 years, okay? And let's move to the second generation, my parents' generation. This is uh, my parents' engagement um, portal. So um, despite of uh, um, liberation from the Japan, still Korea was one of the poorest country in um, 1950. And as you can see here, there were lots of big number of uh, Korean orphans, and many of them were sent to US uh, and other developed uh, European countries with the support of the Korean government. So you guys know that um, the big number of Korean adoptee in um, US and other Western countries, right? And those Korean women who interacted with the uh, um, American troops in the American army camp in Korea, they, there was no legal restriction in terms of marriage, but social 
actually prohibited to get married on um, non-Koreans. So those Korean women or their offspring couldn't stay in Korea, but they had to move to the US. And 1970 and 1980, there was only one national goals in Korea, economic development. We don't care human rights, we don't care only economic development. We need to, we should, we must be a rich country. So Korean government actively initiated lots of programs that send the cheap Korean laborers to um, Germany, European country, and also Middle Eastern country, including Saudi Arabia. There was a big construction boom in Saudi Arabia in 1980. And also um, other groups of Koreans immigrated to Central and uh, Southern South America, including the Chile, Argentina, Peru. So going back to my family history, um, my father, both uh, my mom and my father were born right after the Korean War. Again, Korea was one of the poorest country, so they couldn't even go to middle school. My father, instead of going to middle school, he had to work for a barber shop as a citizen, and my mom had to stay home taking care of younger siblings and uh, um, also helping with the domestic work. Um, and 1980, I think 1982 or three, my father went to Saudi Arabia as a construction worker. So he stayed there a year and a half and saved $8,000. It was a big, huge money at that time. That's what I still remember. So with that money, we bought our very first farm. And uh, the reason my father could make uh, that being money is not because he was working so hard. There was a government strategy. Um, Korean government automatically take 70 or 80 percent of those workers salary directly. And sent to the family in Korea so that um, those Korean workers don't spend their money in that foreign country. So even though they wanted to spend or um, buy a lot of items in that country, sorry, they couldn't do that. So again, the um, national goal was to become a rich country and uh, it was not only individual's effort, but Korean government actually initiated it. So my father, of course, uh, his um, life in Saudi Arabia must be tough, but he never complained about it. And I still remember, yeah, he from time to time talked about um, the time he was in the Saudi Arabia, but um, I never heard, oh my God, it was terrible, it was, um, I worked really, uh, he didn't say anything negative. And uh, my father was not the only one who had a tough life in 1980. Of course, uh, my mom, um, she had to take care of uh, four of us uh, as well as the grandmother. And she also never complained. And four kids, we, every day after we came back from the school, had to go to farm and help my mom. And every weekend, of course, it's a farming day. We had to go to farm. But as far as I remember, we never complained. Actually, I thought, this is what everyone is living. Look at some of them. They are poorer than us. Nothing to complain. And we knew that how much my parents wanted to us to have a better education. We knew that the whole purpose of my father went to Saudi Arabia and my mom worked hard in um, the neighbor's farm. So 
um, to us, uh, for all members of my family, 1980 was a kind of heyday. We remember only those good things. Uh, and again, so I don't remember anything negative, miserable, terrible life at all, because we, all members of my family, has a shared collective dream of bright life, bright future. Um, and for my father, because he was a temporary migrant worker, so he had no desire or interest to immigrate to um, the Saudi Arabia. He knew that, yeah, we'll stay here temporarily. And of course, my homeland is Korea. I will be back and I should be back to Korea. So um, that could be another reason he um, could survive in tough working condition in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, this will be end soon and I'm gonna go back to my homeland. Okay. And uh, let's move to the third generation, my generation. Um, so there is a clear distinction between those Korean Americans uh, who immigrated to the US in 1970, 80, and those moved to 1990 and 2000. So those people moved to the US in 1970, 1980. Many of them are from the poor working class family. Yep. They moved to the US uh, for the better life. However, many of those Korean Americans who immigrated to the US in uh, 1990, especially um, the later part of 1990 over 2000, many of them are from middle upper level class. And uh, so two major reasons they moved here. First group, they really wanted to their children have a better education, educational opportunity in advanced country. Or another group was those individuals in professional career. They wanted to keep their professional career in the US. So um, my older sister's case, uh, she had, uh, she used to work all of her as an IT specialist. So she made a um, decent salary every month. She had a pretty comfortable life as a career woman, professional um, career woman in Korea. But she knew there was a glass ceiling. I know I can promote to this level, but I don't think I can be a CEO or move to upper level. So why don't I just start my second chapter of my career in other country. So because the Australia offered the permanent residency to those um, IT specialists, she moved to the Australia. And similar, my younger sister, as um, her major was engineering, and she knew that as a female engineer in Korea, traditional Korean organization culture, mm -mm, there's a very limited position you can have. So she, um, after got her PhD, she decided to pursue her career here. And now she's working for Columbia University. And um, my case and my younger brother's case, uh, it was not about the glass ceiling. I'm not saying um, there was no blood ceiling in my industry, public relations uh, um, industry, but the main reason I came here was I wanted to take advantage of a degree from US and the power of English. So after Korean War, um, the South Korea was heavily influenced by American culture. And some people even say, cultural imperialism. And the most of the Koreans value what Americans are doing, okay, education system, culture, even food, everything from US to Western culture is good. On traditional Korean, uh -uh, not good. Of course, nowadays uh, it has been changed a little bit, but early um, 1990, 2000, um, there was a huge 
value, strong value of uh, um, degree from the US and also the, um, the person who speak fluent English. So, um, but anyway, yeah, after getting PhD, I decided to stay here and my younger brother got back to Korea and now he's working for the international um, transnational company. So for us, uh, um, it was uh, one of uh, many options for us. Uh, yeah, we could stay in Korea or I can move to the Australia, Canada or other country. Um, but for us, uh, maybe at this point, uh, for me, staying here, US uh, might be the best option to keep doing my career and my work is the same. Yeah. Staying here as a um, government officer in the um, Australia would be the best option for me. However, um, we are kind of a flexible. So if there's a better options, uh, we don't mind uh, to live here and uh, um, find a new career in other countries. And even my younger brother, so after getting his uh, um, degree, he thought Korea was the best place. Uh, and it was true at that time, but nowadays, uh, as the um, economy is becoming more competitive uh, and especially considering his kids uh, education, their future, my brother is considering thinking of uh, finding job in other nearby Asian country like Hong Kong, Singapore, or um, the other country. So for us, uh, um, Korea is not the country we must return or the only option, one of the many options we can choose. So, um, and um, okay. so summary, brief summary and reflections, as I already touched a little bit um, for my grandparents' generation. So it was uh, um, almost, uh, it appeared they voluntarily, personally moved to the um, other country, but it's a part of an international event, World War II, the Russia, America, Japan, North Korea, South Korea. It's a part of um, the that macro level event. And it was uh, almost like the only option to survive. And for them, homeland is the place they must return. And my parents' generation, second generation, um, again, it looks like a um, personal choice, but without Korean government initiative or that government sponsored the program, my father wouldn't be able to get a job in uh, Saudi Arabia. And as I mentioned, because of their unique um, policy or restriction, we could save big money. So my father's case is part of a national event, what Korean government did. Right? And the third generation for us, um, <laughs> Now, maybe we can say it's a real personal choice. Yeah, they had many other options, but personally, they wanted to pursue this professional career or to get a better education. But I think it's also part of a global trend. It's not only Korean, but many people, educated people in other country, they also, freely move around the many different countries. So um, in my opinion, it's a part of a globalization trend. And I think, yeah, we are running out of time. So I'm done. And last, one more thing. Um, so one big, big, big lesson I learned from this experience of working with 12 contributors from different country as well as different background. So um, we had to work with uh, many scholars uh, who had a uh, different academic background. 
The writing was totally different from what I learned here in the US. And of course, also some of them, um, English was not their first language, of course, especially this actress, Kazakhstan. She was Korean, but she grew up in Kazakhstan. And when she wrote this chapter, she was a PhD student in Japan. So she was fluent in Korean, Kazakhstan, Japanese, but not English. And I, when I got her chapter, I couldn't even understand what she was trying, trying to say. But that's pretty another editor, co-editors uh, were willing to whew, rewrite her chapter. He edited every single sentence of this um, person's chapter. So it was a uh, um, kind of a painful, challenging, but great lesson, great experience. So thank you for listening. And now I would be happy to um, get your feedback as well as answering to your question. Thank you. All. Thank you. So again, thanks for stopping the share screen. So we'd like to invite first questions for EJ, and then we can open for larger consideration. I guess I had a quick question, actually, uh, for you, Jay, um, if I may. Um, I'm really. Did you analyze those photos of my family <laughs> as a visual. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was really struck by them. Yes, um, I, I was. I didn't have quite the same kind of analytical hat on um, that I normally do when I'm in the archives. <laughs> but um, I mean, I was really struck by the the barber shop oh. too. Um, and, and how much I need to learn about how to see, right? Because I wouldn't necessarily have thought that that was a barbershop just on first view, mm -hmm. um, but that may be more apparent to other people with a different kind of cultural background or cultural experiences. So that, that actually, I guess I did have a little bit of an analytical hat on. Um, <laughs> But I guess I the main reason is because there was no simple sign of a barber shop. It's like, mm, is it barber shop? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I guess the question I did have though was, um, I guess maybe among your among the different authors who were contributors to the book, did you sort of get a sense for um, different perspectives that they might have about homeland based on a particular region that they or their family members uh, move to uh, either you know in the last generation or this generation or the generation before that in any of these three generations so I guess more specifically you know uh, where was there you know a contributor for, for example um, from Kazakhstan who um, may have had a different perspective on homeland based on you know a particular Kazakh um, experience that people of Korean descent had there versus somebody from Peru, for example, or Japan? Mm. Um, first of all, the author so from Kazakhstan, her chapter was about the um, <laughs> content analysis of a Korean ethnic newspaper, Leningich, I don't know you heard about it or not. So um, she didn't write about her personal experience. But um, another interesting contributor, um, he was born in Korea, but he immigrated to the Peru with his parents. And now he's currently teaching in Hong Kong. And seems like he had a kind of an ambivalence of uh, um, his uh, identity. Maybe um, for him, the Korea is a symbolic country homeland, yeah, Korea is my home country, but I'm not sure. I, I don't personally don't consider uh, myself as a Korean. So, um, and what others, the other reason, um, the Japan or yeah, um, one, two contributors, uh, third generation of Janiji means that um, Korean Japanese in Korea. So um, they didn't write about their own experience, but it was uh, more about 
their grandparents experience so as an ethnic minority, especially those people from the colonized country. So in many talked a lot about their discrimination or the, um, the, the negative experience. And of course, they still held very strong ethnic, uh, Korean ethnic identity. But those two others, third generation of uh, um, Korean Japanese, I don't know, it could be um, more complicated since they got a um, degree here in the US and teaching here. I don't know if this is a clear answer or not. <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. And again, we want to open it up for any questions or comments. And let me just go ahead and say, I understand if we have to drop off to switch to the gen ed meeting in a few minutes, but those who can say. Um, Carolina, do you want to share your comments? Uh, I am not too, too familiar with the co Korean uh, community, but among the immigrant communities, uh, it's considered that they have a very high work ethic. Oh. Um, in Chile, your country? Yes. Mm. So I just wanted to tell you that. Uh, and they live mostly in a neighborhood that used to have a, a lot of people from Lebanese descent mm -hmm. origin, and then more Koreans arrived and, and they have their shops and they are famous for good prices, good products, uh, good work ethic. Do they usually in fashion or the fabric industry? Yes. Yeah. I read those previous study article about those Koreans in Argentina or the other part of Central or South America. The majority of Koreans are in yeah, fabric, fashion industry. <laughs> yes, textile, clothing, mm -hmm. yes. Mm. Thank you, Caroline, wow. <laughs> I'll just I jump a, in with it. A question for uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, what what, what uh, did you find most surprising or interesting in doing the research for your for your book? One of the most uh, fascinating um, components of my research really had to do with the role of women, frankly. So it's it's the case that so many. That, that men are primarily the ones who are trained to be engravers, photographers, lithographers, et cetera, um, just because of the, I mean, quite frankly, like the sexism of the period, mm -hmm. um, right? This belief that men and women have different quote unquote natural roles to play, um, right? In public versus private life. But what I found most fascinating was how women were often the ones who circulated these images. They were the ones who were responsible for collecting funds, for example, right? Uh, from that that one page from William Wells Brown's pamphlet, you know, it's it's clear that all the people who are collecting these funds are women, and that's understood to be a sort of acceptable woman's role in in public life at that time. But it it sort of went well beyond that because so many of these women were the ones who purchased these books. They were one of the target audiences for these um, escaped slave narratives. And, and also for the stationery, the, the paper that is you know, sent back and forth between, um, between people. And so a lot of the women are the, the fundraisers, they, they organize fundraising events, they actually collect the funds, they're the ones who actually pay um, for some of this material. They, you know, it's really kind of remarkable that, you know, historians have written about this to a certain extent, but I, I think they're still underappreciated in um, sort of larger historical circles because they really helped move the anti-slavery movement forward um, quite dramatically. So. I'll just jump in quickly since I have to run over to the gen ed meeting, um, but to say that thank you both for these presentations and there's much, much more to come. Um, I guess more immediately um, we're working on an event um, to sort of unpack the recent uh, incidents of uh, violence and, and prejudice expressed against Asian Americans. We'll sort of unpack that, that construct. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, we want to sort of, we are, we're always sort of tempted to do a ripped from the headlines kind of approach, but 
historians know that these issues have been with us a long time and they don't go away quickly. So um, watch for, for uh, further opportunity to, to discuss um, um, issues of Asian American identity and what that means in a specifically American context and then in a broader global context coming up. And then uh, as far as um, Africana studies, I wanna thank a great group of colleagues and, and, and shout out in particular to Chris for getting the proposal for the Africana studies major. Uh, into curriculog, so that is in the works and is coming, and uh, we're hoping to um, launch that major officially. There's going to be sort of a soft launch before that, but in the fall of 2022, with a semester that will focus on Africa and the world as a cultural programming theme. So in addition to lots and lots of great course offerings, we'll have um, cultural offerings, and we hope a couple of global seminars as well. So this all this is neither of these is one and done. Uh, they really fit into the fabric of the Fulton School and the experience we support for our students. So thank you all for coming today and keep the discussion going. But I've got to jump over to Jen Ed. Thanks, everybody. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And again, we understand if you have to drop off, if you have a minute to stay with us to finish up the discussion, that would be great. And again, anyone can unmute. Uh, one of the titles I noticed on EJ's slide that I think applies to both your talks was about the unspoken and the unheard stories. And so I'm wondering if either of you want to speak to that. That's sort of my takeaway. I heard so many things that I wish I had known sooner than today. And so Ashton or, or EJ, want to comment on how you've kind of captured these unheard stories? Any more time to think? Ask them why don't you start? Can I sure. say something? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just your question, Chris. Uh, your question reminded me of this very short documentary. Um, the I think it's part of the New Yorker documentary I saw uh, recently. It's about an Asian family, I think maybe Vietnamese or something, an Asian family kind of finally revealing their own traumas to each other. Mm -hmm. So parent, uh, the dad, the mom, and then their two daughters and so on. And so when uh, this idea of unspoken, untold, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, I mean, it's true of, um, I think, just uh, immigrant populations in general, but I think for Asians particularly, um, maybe also for some other ethnicities too, but for Asians, it's very, very hard for you to open yourself up, even to your family members. So there's this kind of stigma um, against expressing your emotions. Um, and so that, that also relates to, you know, issues like mental health and, and so on, just this kind of, you're supposed to keep it to yourself. You're not supposed to talk about it. And so that's one thing I thought of that. Um, so it's in addition to just the immigrant experience being something that in general may not be visible or you know talked about with others, with their peers or with the younger generations, but also just this kind of cult cultural uh, barrier uh, against sharing it. So that's, Something I thought of. Yujia, thank you for mentioning that in New York article. I think I read it. So it was about the Chinese parents, especially the father, got beaten or kind of on the harassment on the street, but he didn't mention it at all to his daughter, but just keep saying, You work harder and to be succeeded, and I don't want you to know about this, right? It's a different one, but it just, I think it just adds to my point. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. um, so um, it reminds uh, the, yeah, my grandparents. So because none of my grandparents, even parents, talked anything about their life during the Japanese colonization, for me, for my generation, brothers, sisters, it was just the history we learned from the school, formal education. But to be honest, uh, I didn't have a real personal negative feelings or kind of um, 
feelings of oh Japanese is enemy because I never heard about it from my family members so and I feel like I have no personal issues with them at all it's just what we learned from the school and I still remember when I was a college student, my father showed me the uh, notice from the Korean government was about the compensation program for those Koreans who got injured or um, died in Japan. And when I went there, they asked me to provide an additional document to prove your grandfather injured there or lost a family member there. But I had no interest at all. Okay, you want me an additional document? Mm, I don't think I can find it. Never mind. I don't I don't care this money. Okay. So um so yeah that kind of perpetuate this again 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 instead of um doing something to fix uh, the problem even when we experience this kind of um the um anti-racism or the all kind of a social issues. Uh, so yeah, we should speak out and um, um, thank you, Vijay, pointing out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aston. Yeah, I was just gonna say um, on the on the topic of you know unheard, unspoken. I think what I'm trying to do in this book too is to really sort of shift our perspective because we often think about activism and politics being something that is mostly the purview of electoral politics or um, right people sending in petitions, people marching the streets. And that is all political activity, don't get me wrong, or at least it can be. But it also, right, if we if we take a look at the 19th century when this is when this is when the photo the photograph is being invented, right? People are inventing the steamboat and the right the railroad they're traveling and seeing the world in ways that were totally impossible before um I, there's a whole new way that people are consuming information and it's you know overlapping with this really um important moment or you know decades in american history about right where is slavery going to be where is it not what rights might african americans have or not have what about women right there are all of these sort of shifting pieces about um, right who counts as an american or an equal american at this time and looking at images and people consuming them and their messages over and over again right day in and day out i think is a way of adding to this conversation about what counts as politics because it's clear that African Americans knew the stakes of what images could do. And that's why some of them became engravers and photographers and lithographers and chose to depict the people that and the issues that they did. So I'm really trying to sort of sort of uh, shift our attention, I think, to to really get into the mindset of what a 19th century person would have seen and perhaps thought. Uh, when they when they engaged with these images in public in homes etc so it's it's a lot that's unspoken i suppose you know unheard and unspoken it's it's visual it's a different kind of sensory um perception here as you're saying at the same time so present right it, it's mm -hmm. history there just waiting to be discovered mm -hmm. other questions or comments Hi, um, I had a question for Aston. Um, I noticed that when like the title had a very um, contrasting uh, images, one was very formal and the other one was very informal. So I was wondering, or very natural, I would say. Um, so I was wondering, um, how did you choose the images that you would put in your book. And I noticed that a lot of the, the pictures were formal um, and the men looked very regal. Um, was there the concept that a black man couldn't be like in a natural state and also be very noble? It's a great question. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll start with the first question about how I chose the, the images and essentially, I, I reproduced, I think, 
every image that I found in the archives um, that I knew definitively, definitively was created by an African-American photographer, engraver, lithographer, um, which is to say there isn't, you know, there aren't hundreds, but um, I did exclude several that were created by um, James Presley Ball because I, he, he actually is very, very, he was very, very famous in the 1850s and 60s and depicted a lot of people in sort of everyday portraiture. So they would just go to his photography studio and he would take their photo and they would go home with all those images, right? But there were some of his that seemed especially um, important for the particular conversations around race in the period that he was practicing. So uh, like, it's very, very uncommon for there to be images of, um, of guns being drawn, right, and visible in um, sort of a standard portrait. And it's this, the image that was, that I reproduced here in the slideshow was, right, of a very particular event. We know generally the dates that it had, like the window of time when it happened. And um, so I, I did actually exclude a fair amount of James Presley Ball's portraits of just like every, everyday people who came in uh, for, for a, a photo. But I mean, I think everything else I, I reproduced because it's clear that these engravers, photographers, lithographers had a, a very keen point of view and were using their visual skills in a particular way during the period. Mm -hmm. um, the second question about how African-American men looked in particular, whether, you know, what was considered natural versus formal. Mm -hmm. I think they're really trying to, um, I think the artists are really trying to display these these men as a uh, as essentially the same type of person as a, a man of European descent who would have his portrait taken or or created as a way of saying there's no difference between you and me, right? That um, the the sort of trappings of of class and respectability are the same and we should be viewed as the same as intellectually as as mentally equivalent or um, certainly not inferior. Um, the, the next project I'm working on is actually about instances of black genius and so there, there are enslaved and free black people who um, obviously you know have mental capacities and, and skills that surpass you know the vast vast majority of all the other people uh, regardless of race that they're surrounded by. So um, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about how one is pictured physically, um, right? How their exterior is sort of a mirror, if you will, or a window into the interior capabilities of that person. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so you were going more by their choice of how they perceived it and not your choice though. So. Oh, right. Yeah, no, this is all about, I mean, I have lots of opinions about uh, these <laughs> portraits, but I'm very much trying to understand how people in the 19th century understood these, these images and these people. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dick, did you want to share your thought about immigration experience that you put in the chat? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I just know from my own family and my wife's family, European, not Asian, but uh, certainly the uh, my parents' generation, which would be equivalent to um, Professor Han's uh, grandparents, um, you know, with the, with the trauma of, of World War II. For example, my uh, my uh, wife's uh, uncle uh, from her mother's brother uh, was sent to Siberia um, by the Russians when they invaded Estonia. They were Estonians. And uh, he never spoke about it. Mm. Never spoke about it. He, he fortunately came back and and made it to the U.S. after the war. Um, but he would never speak about that uh, to anybody in, in the family. Um, and I had on my French side uh, uh, had a, um, my mother had a distant cousin who had spent some time in a concentration camp. Mm. And needless to say, he didn't uh, share mm. that. Uh, but. I, I think in part it might be generational, but I think it's the you know the shock, the the very difficult uh, times that they had. It's it's something they don't even want to relive at times, just talking about. Um, and I don't know if that would be true, of, you know, 
the current generation going through similar traumas or not, um, I don't know, but uh, I, I think the, the, the type of experience may, may dictate how much you're willing to share with others. And there's also cultural too, because Estonian men are not very emotional. I mean, that's a stereotype that I've been told. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I'm going to have to leave here, but. Uh, thank you. Well, we can go ahead and close out. And thank you for being so generous to stay a little extra time. There was just obviously a lot to cover. We, we appreciate it very much. I put the information for the next colloquium in the chat and I'll be sharing that with you. So we'll have grant sponsored service. We'll be looking at the accelerated mentor program in psychology and then the reach ethics program. So it should be very exciting. And again, thank you all so very much. Enjoy your evening and look forward to connecting with you all again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah.